The UK Independence Party seems to be winning increasing support. Its anti-EU stance and its policy on immigration, wanting a five-year freeze on permanent settlement, seems to resonate with many a disillusioned British voter. So with the local elections just around the corner, IB Times examines the rise of UKIP. I met Paul Nuttall, the deputy leader of the party at its London HQ, the aptly named Europe House. What do you think you're doing right then? What are you saying that's encouraging people to, to back you, to vote for you? Well, I think it's a number of things. I think, for example, when it comes to the issue of the EU, uh, more and more people are increasingly Eurosceptic, and we've been proven right on a number of issues regarding the EU, whether it's the Euro, the democratic deficit, or even the open-door policy of the last Labour government when they said only 13,000 people would come, when they opened the, the borders pretty much in 2004. Well, it literally went into the uh, millions. Uh, but also, I think we've become more professional. I think we've got our structures right. I think we're getting our domestic uh, policies out there. And people are realising that UKIP just isn't a single issue pressure group. UKIP is a fully fledged political party with a whole raft of policies. Some don't buy it. Take controversial newspaper columnist Peter Hitchens. UKIP is a nuisance party. Uh, it's a as, as with almost all such parties, it exists on the fringes of politics, it has no hope of power. That makes it, by its nature, irresponsible. It provides a safety valve. The, the, the real problem with our political system is that it's a two-party system. And if you're not one of those two parties, then you will not get a substantial body of members in, in, in the main legislative body. And UKIP performs a safety valve nuisance function and is not, in my view, a serious party. The, the serious issue is, is why the Conservative Party survives when everything that it does defies the wishes of its own members and supporters. It's not a Conservative Party at all, it is a new Labour Party, effectively. The safety valve argument Peter makes does seem to hold water, especially when it comes to the opinion polls. Here's what the head of one of Britain's leading online market research agencies, YouGov, had to say about UKIP's popularity. It's attracting support for people who also feel strongly about immigration and more widely people who are right of centre are unhappy with the performance of the Conservative government. UKIP is getting the kind of right of centre protest vote that 20 years ago, when the Conservatives were last in power, used to go to the Liberal Democrats. But because the Lib Dems are now in the coalition government, they're not getting those protest votes. They've got to go to somewhere, they're going to UKIP. The control of immigration is at the forefront of British people's minds right now. UKIP's stance about European migration is unequivocal. Basically, Brussels dictates the freedom of movement of people, and whilst we're part of the European Union, there's nothing we can do about it. The only way we're going to do something about it is by coming out of the European Union itself, and then we can control our own borders. And quite frankly, I think that would make economic sense for this country. People's worries seem to be borne out in the opinion polls. But the issue of immigration is symbolic of a much deeper malaise. People are worried, they're pessimistic about Britain's future, they're scared. And immigration is an issue that touches those scares and, and, and that fear. And so immigration is a symbolic issue as much as it's a real issue. Fringe or frontline? Over 1,700 candidates will stand for UKIP in the England and Wales local elections, the most it's ever fielded, three times of that in the 2009 elections. The party's expectant. What we're looking at more than the amount of seats that we take is our percentage of the vote and our vote share. If that continues to go up and if we can touch somewhere in the late hundred thousands, I think that will be a fantastic result. Uh, we just don't know though. I mean, UKIP is growing so quickly at the moment. We're putting on over 100 members a day. We're polling around 17%. We rarely, in many ways, come from nowhere. So we just don't know what's going to happen on May the 2nd. I certainly hope that we give everybody a bloody nose and we go back with UKIP councillors elected. A normal Conservative voter who's unhappy with the government, who wants to cast a protest vote, can do it safe in the knowledge that that vote is not going to deliver a Labour government at Westminster, well, has the opportunity in by-elections, in local elections, in European Parliament elections, to register that protest vote. So that will deliver UKIP some council seats, 
Um, I'm sure they will claim it as a great triumph. Um, I think they will be wrong to claim it as a great triumph, but the Conservatives will be right to be pretty worried about the impact of UKIP on the Conservatives' core vote. And UKIP has an eye on future-proofing. Well, part of the fastest growing uh, section of the party is young independents. Uh, we have a lot of young people joining at the moment. Uh, we have societies now at universities. Many of our MEPs go and speak to these societies and speak at universities. And we have a bit of a recruitment drive to get younger people in because, I'll be perfectly honest with you, when I became the chairman in 2008, we were an elderly party. I think the average age of the membership was around 70. That had to be reduced substantially because, obviously, you need people out on the streets delivering leaflets and if a party is to look forward and grow then we needed to bring in younger members so we made that pretty much a priority. But is that youthful ambition reflected in the makeup of UKIP's voters? If you look at a run of polls and get some pretty robust and large numbers we find that the average UKIP voter is more likely to be a man than the average Conservative voter, is more likely to be over 50 than the average Conservative voter and is more likely to have a below average income than the Conservative voter. It is, if you like, typically the not very well off male middle-aged person who used to vote Conservative who's now increasingly turning to UKIP. Handing local people more power to bring councils to account is another crusade. And I think the big scandal out there is chief executives pay. You know, there are around 10 chief executives in this country of councils who are paid more than Barack Obama. There are around 40 who are paid more than David Cameron. These are where the cuts need to happen, not to frontline jobs. And we also believe in direct democracy. We want to trust the people and enough people sign a, a petition, it goes to the council and it will trigger a local referendum. So if you don't want that wind farm built on your doorstep, you can do something about it in your local community. Is there really a political earthquake in the offing, as UKIP would have us believe, or will it just be an inconsequential tremor? You know, this year is the local elections and we're expecting to do very, very well indeed. Next year is the European elections, which we're projected to go on and win, and we could send over 20 MEPs back to Brussels, which means that the majority of British MEPs in the European Parliament will be people who want to get out, and then, I think the most important months for UKIP are the next six months after the European elections where we have to get ready for that general election and we have to fill every single seat with a UKIP candidate because we have a duty. We have a duty to every single person in this country to give them the opportunity to go out and vote UKIP. And look, if we win those European elections and we're still polling around 17-18%, come the general election, we get on the leaders' debate, all better off. The party's taken the main share of the protest vote from the Liberal Democrats and they're encroaching on traditionally Labour heartlands. But perversely, the very differences in the voting systems, proportional representation for the European Parliament elections and first-past-the-post for British elections could completely obliterate UKIP's hopes altogether. The worry is that in seat after seat, UKIP will pick up three, four, five thousand votes that would mostly go otherwise to the Conservatives and that as a result of the Conservative votes eroding to UKIP, those seats will be won by Labour or the Liberal Democrats. In other words, the UKIP might have a big impact at the next general election without winning a single seat itself. And the better UKIP does, the greater the chance that we'll have a Labour-led government after the next election. In other words, and here's, if you like, the ultimate paradox, the more people vote for UKIP, the more likely it is that Britain will have a pro-European government after the next general election. Though some commentators believe the very voters UKIP want on side could pop the party's balloon and bring its very steep ascent to an abrupt halt, there's no doubt an awful lot can happen between now and 2015 in what's clearly the fastest moving political landscape Britain's seen for decades.